Welcome back to War Tamper Woodworking. My name's Sean, and today we're going to be talking about the grand unifying theory of spindle design. Now, I'm going to qualify this video right here and now. I do not consider myself an artist, or actually a very good craftsman. I consider myself a teacher who's just constantly looking for new ways to express an idea so that a beginning level, level student can ramp up their learning curve to get to a high enough level so experts can come in and send them sky high. Now this doesn't mean I want to have more knowledge than the experts, I just want to be able to explain it better so that the student understands more and can apply more and can retain that knowledge a lot longer. Now in my mind, spindle turning is the true art form in, this, in the turning world. And I've heard it time and time again. A good spindle turner can transition into other branches of wood turning and succeed with fairly little more learning or effort. It's a tool control that they really do grasp. Whereas somebody that's just a strict bow turner, they might need to transition to spindle turning for something and they struggle a little while with the learning curve. The spindle turning just gives you that dexterity to do the other forms. But that doesn't mean if you learn to spindle turn that you're going to have that artistic expression you see out there with those really fine finials or the great chair, uh, stair banisters or even chair legs. They're just expertly turned with these perfect curls, curves that just seem to express so much. That is a true art form. And if you're wanting to learn that kind of stuff, it can be really frustrating, especially if you're a nincompoop learner like me who just goes into these lectures or these symposiums or reads the books and think that, that I understand they're speaking English, but I don't understand what they are saying. Now here's an example. I truly respect a spindle turner by the name of Cindy Drozda. Her finials are truly artwork. I mean, that she's kind of the go-to person in finials and symposium for people to bring in to teach on that one stuff. So in this last symposium, I spent a entire session just learning her design principles. And I left it just lost. I hate to say it. I just did not understand. And she's also written many articles. And here's an example. Let me give you a quote. This is from American Association of Wood Turning. They got permission to reprint an article that she titled An Analytic Approach to Finial Design. An Analytical Approach to Finial Design. And here's the opening quote for the whole piece. Transitions separate the elements and provide the composition with a beginning and an ending. Like two punctuations in a piece of music, transitions control and direct the motion of the composition. And the article goes on from there. It's like they're speaking in big abstracts, whereas me as a beginner, I just need some foundations for me to base my initial expressions on. And then maybe after I turn 10,000 pieces, we can talk about bigger abstracts. Just give me a basic foundation. And I really haven't found anything out there to give that. So that's what we are going to be working on is I'm hypothesizing with th this theory that this might be able to help some people out. And always be weary of people trying to encompass a whole philosophy down to one or two sentences because they basically strip away all nuance. I hate to say it, they might even strip away the artistic. But I just want a foundation to start on. That's what we're all we're trying to do here. So here's my idea. In artistic spindle design, you are allowed to repeat themes, proportions, ratios, symmetries and volumes, but never dimensions. And you want to do this on a golden ratio mean. To simplify it even further, you're allowed to repeat elements, but just not dimensions. And try and do it on a two-thirds scale, where two to one ratios. And from there, just experiment. See what works. See what your artistic expression comes up with. This is a bit of trial and error, but every beginning painter starts by drawing stick figures. And that's the artistic level we are at right now. So this grand unifying theory of spindle design is simply, you're allowed to repeat elements, 
just don't repeat dimensions. Now the exercise I've devised to explore this theory is based on a lot of different motivations. Uh, once again, I work art markets quite a bit to pay my bills and I want to come up with top, uh, seasonal items that it's fairly quick for me to make that I can make a decent profit on and it'd be nice if I could sell a whole bunch during that one season but then continue to sell the products year round. And I'm thinking Valentine's Day is coming up so making a nice ring boxes to complement other gifts would be a good idea and in the off season since it seems four out of five artists in art markets are jewelry vendors maybe I could sell these ring boxes to other vendors who could then pass it on as, as maybe a secondary sale. The other motivation is I have a whole bunch of experiments and mallet designs or mallets I made that didn't quite deem sellable or ones that I was using in the school or for whatever reason I still have them and they are fully dried wood so it's fairly valuable wood to me. Well I can make little ring boxes with finials on the top to explore this theory uh, and make something productive so I'm not just wasting my time. I actually make time turn time into money. And the idea originally came from this picture that I've been I've had on my wall for about a year now. And this guy did a uh, design exercise where he's been making little ring stands, something to just put your wedding ring on while you wash dishes and he's making hundreds of them of all different woods and he's promised himself he's never going to do the same one twice. That's just a uh, creative exercise to improve his artistic skills. I like that idea. And I'm going to apply that same thing here. I'm not going to make a single one the same. And then at the end, we can examine them. See how they adhered to my grand unifying theory. And in the comments below, y'all can say, hey, did it work? Did it that? Did it not work? Which one did you like? Which ones did you not like? And we'll go from there. Now I don't expect this video is going to be on how to turn a box kind of video. Again, this is a design exercise. But I don't want to leave you all out on the crowd. So real quickly, I'm going to show you the tools I'm going to be using most of the time, or most of the tools, uh, how I use them, a few techniques, and then we'll go from there. While I'm doing this, I'm also going to film a secondary video to kind of complement this that just delves into lid construction and lid joining. Uh, that I think will be pretty cool that we'll, we'll explore it a few days later. So te let's take a look at the tools and techniques I'll be using to create these boxes and then we will go along and build a whole bunch of them and after it's done, explore from there. Okay, like we've said earlier, this is spindle turning, which basically means that the tree is on its side spinning around its center. So you're always going with the grain if you're going towards the center of the tree. This is not like bowl turning, where you might actually be spinning the tree like this, so you're going to end grain, long grain, end grain to long grain. And a lot of these times I'm going to be basically starting between centers, which means I have a drive center on this side and a live center which spins freely on this side, squeezing it in between. And this is a very safe way of turning it. I, I, in my particular instance, I have a drive center that's being squeezed in a chuck because I'm going to be using a chuck for most of the work. Basically, I'm going to turn a tenon to put into the chuck to hold it so I can take away this live center and it can just free, spin freely. I'm also going to be using two lays. I have a little mini lay that I take out to a lot of demonstrations and stuff. And instead of having to take parts off, put them back on, get them all realigned, it's a lot easier for me to just chuck up one half of a box on this side, another half on the box of this side, and then to make sure that the parts fit together, I can take this chuck off without taking the wood out of it and put it over here. It's a efficiency for mass production in my mind. So that's why I'm going to be trying out this way. I'm also trying out a chuck I borrowed from my dad to see how it is. This is a new grizzly style, so we're going to see how it uses. Uh, I've got a, what they call spigot chuck on that one because Basically, these mallets, this is going to become the top and the finial. So I will turn this very even and I'll be able to slide it in here to turn the base to the fitting mechanism. And then I could take that off once it gets fitted perfectly, 
put it on there, tape it down, and then turn a finial to match the rest of it. So it should make things a little bit easier. Now the first bit is to always get rid of all the roughness, make everything even. And because this is spindle turning, I can use a spindle roughing gouge. Now this is only used in spindle turning. Whenever I remove the live center away and start doing ingrain work, this will not come out. The reason being is they make these by folding up a flat piece of metal, which means the metal is flat when it goes into the tang, so it's very, very weak. And you don't want to be turning ingrain with this one because if it catches and grabs, it will either bend or break at that thing, spin around, stick in your neck, and you'll bleed to death. That's a Jimmy Choo Clues saying. I just kind of like it because it's memorable. You just don't want to use this on anything other than spindle gouges, spindle turning. So you might use this for roughing. Oh, by the way, I got both of these lathes in their high gear and I just spin as fast as they'll go. Okay, so once you guys smooth around, this tool is now done. Now I will say, I use this a lot of times on other spindle trains when I'm just trying to remove a lot of bulk worth because it's very easy to sharpen this style tool. The second tool you'll see me use quite a bit, especially in spindle turning, is a skew gouge. Especially this bigger one, though I do use a smaller one as a black handle, but both of them are sharpened the same. They've got a straight point on half of it that's at a slight angle, and then the other half is curved. And this tool does a lot of my bulk work. If I need to remove material really fast, I might do what's called a paring cut by laying it down face, riding my bevel, and just taking away material. You can also do beads with it. Just ride the edge and kind of cur curve them over. You can also use V-cuts with it. Just coming up from the top. And if you're doing beads, a lot of times you start out with a V-cut, and then you round it over with your be. And then a lot of times it's just a paring cut where you're just kind of coming along the end and let, taking wood off. So those are the main cuts I do with the skew gouge. I mean skew. The other tool you're going to see me use quite a bit is my Achilles heel. I have more trouble with this tool than anything out there. And I'm trying a new grind on it it's a modified fingernail. Notice it's not, it's a little bit more pointy than the fingernail. And to hopefully it'll help me eliminate a few of my errors and my catches and stuff like that. But I have more catches with this tool than anything I own. Uh, it's just the one tool I struggle with, which seems to be exact opposite of everybody else. Everyone else has problems with the skew, whereas I have problems with this gouge. And basically it operates by riding that bevel and you can do beads with it by starting out high, rotating and coming low, or you can do codes where you start it low and rotate it to come in high. Just like that. And that's basically all this tool is ever going to do. Beads and codes. Now I will also use the wing on this and use it as a skew to make skewing cuts. And that saves me wasting away the sharpness of the edge. I can use the sharpness of the sides to get rid of some bulk work if I ever need to. And finally, I'll be using scrapers to doing some hollowing. Uh, one will be curved with a half curve on it, like that. And one will be straight across, but it's not at 90 degrees at a slight angle that will allow me to get it inside the corners without scraping the side on the side of the box so here's a brief overview of my production method it is nothing unique and this is not going to be all inclusive I generally start out with an awl marking out my centers just so that it's easier to line up the live center and drive centers with their little pins I'll start it up and then just rough it out. It doesn't matter if it's a log or one of these mallets. You got to get it smooth first, and that's what the roughing spindle gouge is for. And I will also smooth out the handle so that it will be straight uh, and it will slide into those spigot jaws on the smaller lathe easier. 
Next is just a turning a tin in. Now this live center, I mean this drive center I bought for the one-way chuck is probably the best investment I made all last year. It's just changed the way I do this quite easily because it used to be I had to do a lot of measuring. Now I just look at the chuck right next to it and make the tin in to fit the circle that I see. After that, I chuck it up and I would do the layout. And right here you can see I'm making an equal size box. I'm using my fingers to divide it into thirds. And then it's just parting off the top from the base so that I can slide that into my smaller lathe or a, and the second chuck. Now you can do the same thing if you have two chucks. And I just drastically prefer this because unchucking wood and then testing a fit and then putting it back in the chuck, you always get it off. It never goes in exactly the same. Then just cut off the little waste, slide it in those spigots. And this is a very solid fit because there's a lot of wood, there's a lot of meat inside the jaws that holds it very, very well. Now there are lots of different ways of hollowing out the base and I'll show you a few here. One of my more common ways is using a spindle gouge going straight into end grain. The reason why is if you're doing it this way, it's kind of like spindle turning coming from the outside towards the center, but you're doing it backwards. You're starting in the middle and coming out. So you're actually going with the grain except for that initial cut and you don't have to pre-draw it. This is the way I do most of my demonstrations of hollowing and stuff, or if I'm just making one box, I prefer this way just because it is so damn fast. It gets rid of a lot of material. It, uh, the downside is it is somewhat of a curve. It's hard for me to get straight edges. So after I do that one, a lot of times I'll do the very edge with just a straight scraper. Just uh, push it right in. It's just removing a little bit just to straighten it out and get a nice fit for the tenon that's going to slide into it. Now notice scrapers, especially on hard dry wood, the edge of the burr goes away really fast. It's only going to last about eight seconds. But what's nice is it's really quick to put a new burr on. Just head to the grinder, rub it off. The next way a lot of people do is using a small bowl gouge. The difference between using the bowl gouge and the spindle gouge is on the bowl gouge you start from the outside and work in the end. So in effect you are going against the grain and this results a lot of times in a rougher more torn out interior finish whereas a lot of times with the spindle gouge I can just go straight to you know a 400 grit sandpaper and the finish right away. Other people like to put a depth gauge using a drill bit very easy to make and then you can scrape your way until you see that depth gauge go away. Uh, you can use the same technique with a spindle gouge but it's just an extra step when you're using a spindle gouge. Notice I like to get rid of the at bottoms of my scrapers because on smaller boxes it allows you to get into a tighter fit. And from there, it's just scrape away. It's actually very effective, especially if you're starting from the center because you are going with the grain. Okay, so I'm somewhat in production mode. The easiest way for me to hollow out small items, I mean, beyond an inch or two down, I find it easier to use a spindle gouge. But for small ones like this, it's easier for me to just use a Forstner bit. But when you're turning, you really have to be careful. It is very easy to overheat these, even though they're high-speed steel. But if you start turning them blue in your turnings, which isn't that hard because you can spin these kind of quickly, and there's a lot of friction involved, a lot of sawdust buildup, uh, what I'm getting at is it's easy to uh, lose a temper on these so that they will never hold an edge. So you really have to go slow with these and let them cool quite a bit. But they're fairly simple. I mean, basically you have your tailstock. Just bring it on up. Lock it on down. If you just put it into the tailstock when you're doing it, you sometimes have to hold it. Bring it on up tight. And then turn your lathe on. Make sure it is going in the right direction at a fairly slow speed. Hold it and then just feed it slowly. Feed it slowly. You do not want it to heat up and you do not want to have to bind it up because of sawdust buildup, which happens sometimes whenever you go fairly deep. Uh, I'm only going to go maybe three quarters of an inch in, and that's about it. Now, I will tell you this. I am using the wrong kind of Forstner bit for this action. I'm using a type of Forstner bit that's built for your drill press. And the reason why I say that is because it has a very long pilot point right there 
And the reason why that's there is so that that will anchor into wood and if you're turning it so half of the circle is outside turning air, that'll keep it stable. But when you are turning on a lathe, generally you surface it on the front and all you really need is something to somewhat get it going and this just creates a very deep hole in the base that I now have to take care of with the scraper. So there are pluses and minuses, get the right kind, you can sharpen them up. Uh, this should last you your lifetime if you don't overheat it. Next is a matter of fitting the top to the base. And this is where having two chucks is such a luxury. Because normally I would have to take the base off of the old chuck, put the second piece of wood in there, begin fitting it, aligning it, put the base back on the old chuck, removing the top, and every time you remove and put back on a piece of wood in the chuck, there's a good chance it's going to get off. Even the best of them out there, they're always off like a half a millimeter, and a half a millimeter is all the distant difference when you need a tight top. So having two chucks is a luxury, having two lathes is an even bigger luxury, because as you saw, I just spun off one chuck and moved it over. After I get it fitting pretty good, I like to clean up the bottoms with a blade. And my skew is the best one if I'm wanting a flat bottom. I, I pretty much do them all with a skew. And on some of them, I will go over, I will grab a rounded scraper and just put a little dome or a decoration on the interior. Just a little surprise for somebody when they open up the box. And with the scraper, if you're wanting a finish ready surface, remove the old rough burr and put a new fresh burr that's really tiny onto it to take those nice fluffy shavings. Then it's a matter of rinse and repeat, testing between each little millimeter of wood you take off. When you can get a tight enough fit where it holds up the chuck, you know you're doing pretty well. Uh, I generally will put it back on the small lathe and remove as much of the spindle bulk as I can. Because there's a problem with these jam chucks, when you put them on the lathe, the farther out from the actual join, the torque will torque it off and sometimes the tops will spin off unless you have a perfect fit. So you might as well get rid of all the bulk waste that you can when you've got it in a chuck so that when you're working with the jam fit, it's less leverage acting on it. Some people don't like turning the base at this time. I like to define my dimensions that I'm working with. So I'll turn the bottom down pretty well, just leaving enough there so I can actually get good leverage on the tool. Now when you're turning the top with that jam chuck, you gotta take very light cuts. You don't want that spinning off or torquing off, but the cool thing is you can turn them both at the same time so you get a perfect blending. And when you are far out on the finial, you have to take extremely light cuts. Take it slow, take it easy, uh, and go from there. It won't. T it doesn't add a lot more time taking these small cuts, uh, but it does keep it all balanced and on the jam chuck. Okay, so we have finished the first three, and I thought we I would take a break and we'll analyze the design of them and just kind of freeform think of what was good, what is bad. So as we progress through the other ones, we can make improvements. So let's take a quick look at these first three. So here's the first one I did. And I, on this one, I try to stay in the two-thirds scale, where the top from the handle down to here is two-thirds, and from here to the base is one-third to get those proportions I was talking about. Uh, also, I try to repeat curves. If you look at it, this curve along the side is somewhat repeated across the top and I tried to repeat the same shape on the very top of the handle and this was a somewhat inverse of the top curve. Again, I'm trying to repeat themes here, here, and here, but none of them are in the same plane. Though I probably got this one right here a little bit too close to that one, my personal opinion. Just a standard little box that... Uh, little ring box. Uh, now, you're looking at this and you're thinking, oh, well, obviously that is not perfectly measured. I'm not doing this perfectly. Basically, if I take a section, basically if I take a section of something, I'm just sticking my two fingers up there and that gives me one, two, three somewhat equal segments. I'm not measuring this out too critically. I'm just kind of doing it by eye. So that's where we're going. So here's the first one. The second one I did, I inversed those proportions. I made the handle from here to here roughly one-third and from here to here roughly two-thirds. 
and this distance right here uh, on all of these is roughly two thirds the top from the distance from the top to the bo from the top to the bottom. Uh, it, and the width wise is roughly two thirds. And once again, just a small little top. And I tried to repeat elements. So this top curve, this button right here, hopefully matched this curve right there as best I could. So we have a t small little vase on top of a bigger vase. And the third one is quite different. Instead of doing an outside curve, I did an interior curve both here and here. I tried to repeat this entire shape right there up on the handle portion of it. And I was conscious not to have any point of it, whether the top, the, the little lip right there, the box top, the edge, the bottom edge, or even the base is edge right down there for them to line up at any point. So according to my design, this is probably the best one, but out of the three, I think I kind of like this one the best. Uh, it's It seems a little bit lighter. These kind of appear a lot heavier. This one quite a bit heavier. So there's my critique of the first batch of three. Down in the comments below, tell me what you thought of them and what was done wrong. Okay, here's a batch of the next three, and once again, repeating themes. This one was a lot rounder, so I created a roundness here, here, and on top to repeat the size. And I made sure not to repeat the dimensions anywhere. Uh, just, a, once again, a little box. This one right here, I experimented with, instead of doing curves or coves, I did a taper that's roughly two-thirds to one-third, a rise over run. And I kind of repeated the angles here. Now, once again, these are rough guess estimates of what those measurements would be. Once again, a little box. And this one I repeated yesterday's version of this one. I mean, previous ones where I thought it was a little bit bulkier. And even though this one has more meat to it, it just doesn't appear as bulky to me. But I repeated it. It is more angular, so I added rings to it. Two to three rings. Uh, the beads are on the side to repeat the themes. Uh, trying to repeat angles as much as I can. This being repeated here and there. Once again, repeating elements, just not dimensions. Now, I will show you these two right here. I screwed something up and one of mine blew up. So, I grabbed scraps and I tried to use the same piece of wood for the base as the finials. But this one... It's close to those dimensions. This one was just totally off and it doesn't quite look right to me. I haven't oiled these two, but hey, experiments are still sellable. Somebody will buy it uh, and we'll go from there. Let's get back to it. So here are the next three I did. This one right here, I don't think I really meet, met my design goals of two thirds because it looks to be about equal of this distance here to the top. I was thinking that this distance right here would be the visual break, but it isn't. The lid kind of causes a break right there. So this one doesn't really meet my design goals, but I did repeat themes. I have inward curves and outward curves. Inward curves, outward curves, inward curves, outward curves throughout. So I repeated elements. I just didn't repeat dimensions or uh, didn't repeat dimensions. I think this right here is a little bit too close on this one. I like this one. I thought this one turned out very elegant. Uh, just box-wise, I, I still need to loosen it up a little bit. You kind of have to pull it apart. There's a bit of a vacuum right here. And when you make boxes... You don't want people to have to pick it. This design, I think people want to be able to just pick it up and have it sit there. This one has a little bit of a vacuum fit. But 
I did meet my two-thirds scale where this is one-third and that's two-thirds. I repeated elements from the side to the top and I like this gradual curve right there. I think that turned out pretty well. I tried to repeat it on the top there but it came to a point instead of a finial. And the last one is more of a honey pot style where once again two-thirds of it is a base and one-third is a cap uh, but re themes are repeated throughout with the little beads on it and repeated on the top. So once again I'm repeating elements but I'm not repeating dimensions. Though this one right here I do think I, I got a little bit too close on the dimensions on the finial so it looks a little bit off to me. Once again on the next three, we, we try to repeat elements and do the dimensions. I'm not quite sure I got this one right. This one looks more like a half and a half. I was trying, I thought it'd show up as two thirds and one third, but not really. So I didn't do too well on this one, but the shape blends pretty well. And it's just, once again, just a little box. Uh, I like this one right here. I thought it turned out pretty well. I like how the curves from the side matches up here. It's like this whole shape right here is repeated up there. What I should have done is put a small bead on top to repeat that element, but I didn't think of it at it at the time. Uh, and just again, the little box. On this particular one, I do think I made this top a little heavy, but that's beside the point. It's not part of the design exercise. And this one right here I kind of liked. I got the nice shape, one third down below and two thirds up top. And I repeated this element, this curve down here and up there and got a nice little OG effect. So those are the next three. Let's hit, get back to the lathe and get, make a few more. So here are the final three. I probably made the lid a little bit too tight on this one because it is lifting its own weight, but I have a feeling that they will loosen up after the oil dries and I put a little wax on them. They'll somewhat lubricate them. Uh, the designs, once again, I was going for the one-third for the base and two-third on this, two-third for the lid on top. I do think I somewhat messed up on this one because if you notice on the top section, I didn't realize it, but these two points right here are somewhat in the same plane, so the dimension is the same, and that's something I was going trying to go against. But otherwise, I like the shape of this one quite a bit. I really like the shape of this one. Uh, it is a different style of Morrison tenon, uh, but I like the shape of it, but notice it is roughly one half and one half, so it doesn't meet my design requirements. Uh, which means that there's obviously an error in my theory. And then here's the last one. Uh, once again, I like, I really like the shape. And if you consider this bottom section right here to be two thirds and this being one third, it makes sense. But visually, it really doesn't look that way. It looks like this is all one piece and that's just a little bit on top. But I thought this one came out pretty well. I'm not sure how well it's going to hold a ring on top, but as a little box, it works pretty nice. Now, I did have four mallets that didn't turn out as uh, solid as I thought. They had internal cracks, so I couldn't make them. So these are two pieces I had over leftover materials. I'll probably do the top in a walnut to make it a little bit darker. This is mesquite and this is pecan. This turned out visually to look like it's half and half. 
half and half. I was going for a two thirds and one third, but it just doesn't didn't quite turn out that way. Uh, so I'll probably redo the top of this one in walnut. So of all the ones we've done, I think my favorites. I like this design. I like this design. I really liked this design. I thought this round one turned out kind of cool, uh, shape-wise, uh, and it met my two-thirds and one-third rule, and it was an unusual shape. Uh, and then I liked this one right here, which those two are very similar. The ones I did not like the design-wise is, once again, this one. I did not like that shape. I didn't like this shape, the triangles. And coming back to my very first one, that one now looks a bit odd to me after I've done these others. But all in all, I think the experiment produced a lot of cool looking boxes and it allowed me to experiment. So I think it's fair to say that this theory where you're allowed to repeat elements, but just not dimensions, and you keep it on a two-thirds scale, was a failure. Because it's not universally true. We've shown that. Even though my execution of the experiment probably wasn't dead on, I mean, I was guessing a lot of dimension, we can see that some of the ones that didn't follow those principles, I think look, turned out pretty good, and some of the ones that did just turned out kind of weird. But as an experiment, it was a success because I tried a lot of different stuff. I use this as an incentive to learn, to explore, and to refine turning skills in the pursuit of an artistic expression. But the thing is, we now have experience to tweak that theory, to adjust it. And next time we do an experiment, it might fail again, but we can tweak it even further. We're using the scientific method to develop artistry. Refine that theory through a few more experiments and you're going to develop a style. Refine it even further and you're going to be de developing a recognizable style that's based purely on your impressions, your likes, your dislikes, which will develop into your personal expression and your artistry. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like more, please visit our website, uh, worththeeffort.com. I have a big support page there. It'll show you different ways you can support us so I can continue to make these. And one last thing I want you to remember, it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.